Welcome course takers to section four, basic landing zone design. In this section, we're gonna cover the basic building blocks of a landing zone. Now a landing zone is an Amazon term for just the basic infrastructure building blocks that make up your infrastructure prior to you deploying applications into it. So if you look at any reInvent videos or Amazon technical literature, you'll often see the term landing zone, and it just means the infrastructure you're going to deploy your application into. In this section, we're going to cover the basic building blocks, VPCs, connectivity, EC2, uh, Route 53, RDS, all the things that you should be familiar with. So you can look at this just really as something that helps you remember certain characteristics. So you can look at it as a refresh of your basic Amazon knowledge. Okay, so if you're ready, let's get started with video one and we'll look at how we build a custom VPC. So let's start with an analogy. So in this analogy, we have a house, house number 10, flat one to four, and it has an exchange that connects the house, the flats, and the outside world. So there are some rules here. People within a flat can obviously talk to each other, but they need to know everybody's name. People in the house can talk between flats as long as they know the flat number and the person's name. And then the people in the house can also talk outside of the house and people outside the house can talk to people inside the house as long as they know the house that they're trying to talk to, the flat they're trying to talk to and the person within the flat. And all numbers, names, the addresses must be unique. So if we look at a VPC, a VPC really is the house and it's described using an IP range. So in this case, it's 10.1. So anything beginning 10.1 in this account belongs to this VPC. You then break that address, that 10.1 address range into four flats or four subnets, 10.1.1 for subnet one, flat one, 10.1.4 for flat four, subnet four. And now everything can talk to each other through a root table. Okay, and root table also allows you to talk outside of the house as well. So there's a couple of things to bear in mind. So by default, a VPC is allocated a slash 16 address. That gives you 65,000, roughly 65,536 IP addresses to play with. And you can go as small as a slash 28. So often you'll be asked a question in the exam, you know, what's the default range or what subnets can you use? What masks can you use? slash 16 to slash 28 is the answer. Now, we'll talk about what a net mask is in more detail next, but really it just describes what part of an IP range is the network, it's the address, so it's the house, it's the flat, and what part is the host, is the person. So you can have up to 200 subnets, that's a big VPC, and as I've mentioned, you use the root table to actually allow communication between all the subnets and in and out of the VPC itself. Now, it used to be that you could only have one IP range per VPC, but that's changed. So you can have now up to five address ranges associated with your VPC if they're IPv4, and additional one if they're v6. And v4 and v6, the address space, anything that you see with a 1.1.1.1 type address, that's a typical version 4 address range. But version 4 addresses have been exhausted. You can no longer get address ranges. You have to go through an internet address agency or we have to be Amazon. Version six is a later version. It's a different address notation. Uh, we're not gonna cover that here. You don't need to know it for the exam. Um, you just need to know that there is a difference between version four and version six in terms of the way that you look at the addresses. So you should already have a good familiarity with IP addressing. If you don't, I suggest you get Go online, Google IP addressing. There's some very good guys out here. But when IP addressing TCP IP was first used for the internet, people used classful addressing. Class A, B, C, there are other classes, but these are the primary ones. And all that meant was you used a standard mask. So in class A, you used a slash eight, which meant the first octet defined the network. So if network one needed to talk to network two, both of which are class I A addresses, they would need to go through a router. If network one wanted to talk to 128.1.1.1, which is a class B address, it would need to go through a router and so on. Class A, B and C, the difference is how many IP address ranges you get for hosts. So in a class A, 
you get, I think, 16 million. That's all the orange section. In class C, you get 256. The problem with classful addressing is very quickly you ran out of space. So there are very few organizations that still have a class A. So Apple, I think, have 17. Some of the big US corporations have class A addresses. But most of the class A addresses have been handed over to internet assignment authorities to allow you know broadband access to allow other companies to do it but it still meant that you had you know a lot of addresses so people began subnetting that's taking the second host address second octet and making it smaller so they could allocate it more efficiently to different organizations so classless internet domain routing cider addresses just mean that you've actually got a variable subnet mass. So you're not using a slash 8 or a slash 16 or a slash 24. You can use a slash 28 if you want to. And that's the difference. That's really it's all meant by a CIDR range. So instead of using standard classful addressing, an 8, a 16 or 24, you can use a slash 28. So connectivity is all done through root tables. Now you've got a couple of options. If you want to deploy a website, for example, you can deploy it into a subnet, then you can add an internet gateway to your root table, and that will allow you to have inbound and outbound access to the internet. If you only want to provide access to the internet from inside, so you want to use, for example, downloading patches or file share, but you want to initiate all your connections out, but don't want anybody to access your systems from outside, then you can use a NAT gateway. That gateway connects to an internet gateway, it connects to a public subnet, but it only allows outbound access. So you can't access servers behind a NAT gateway from the internet itself. So you can consider it slightly more secure than an internet gateway. But of course, you still have security rules and network access controls around everything you're doing. You'll often see a term NAT instance. You can deploy EC2 instances to act as your NAT gateway. This is not recommended practice anymore. It's not scalable. So while you still might see references to a NAT instance, actually it's preferred to use a NAT gateway, which is an Amazon service. And then if you want to connect to your own private data center or a third party over a private link, you can use a virtual private gateway. And this provides you with internet, well, provides you with private access through a VPN or a tunnel. All of these connect through a root table. So root tables are the way you manage connectivity across your subnets and across inside and outside of your VPC. By default, when you create an account, you'll get a default VPC. A default VPC starts with 172.31 is a slash 16. So you get 65,000 private addresses. Then depending on what region you deploy into, you'll get any number of subnetworks, all starting with slash 20. So in London, for example, there are three availability zones, so you'll get three subnets. It will also create an internet gateway, it will create a main routing table, and then it will create a default security group, a default NACL network access control list, and a default DHCP option set. And we'll look at those in a second. Things to bear in mind, a VPC is not a security construct. All it does is group things together. So you can use security groups and network ACLs to restrict access. You can use root tables to isolate different servers and different EC2 instances from each other, but it's not really a security control. Some people view it that way and use it, but that's very old style thinking. The one thing to bear in mind is instances will always default to your default VPC. So you have to create a default VPC. And when you create an instance, the first thing in the drop down menu will be the default VPC. So it's useful to keep the default VPC in place, but often it's good practice not to use it. So that if somebody does by error or through malicious use begin to deploy resources, they normally fall into default VPC, which has no external connectivity at all. You can delete VPC at any time but you have to remove any EC2 instances or any instances deployed into your VPC. Now, if you use the console and delete the default VPC, it will delete everything for you. If you do it through the CLI or through the SDK, then you have to delete everything individually. So starting with things like the internet gateway and order is important. You can't remove 
subnets if you've still got internet gateways or net gateways connected to them. But you do need at least one default VPC per region. And you can always recreate it using AWS EC2 create default VPC command line if you want to. So let's have a look at the default VPC. Here I have my Amazon console. I click on VPC. And here I have all the elements of my VPC. So the things we've been talking about, root tables, subnets, VPCs. We look at the VPC. How do we know it's a default VPC? Well, we can see that actually this is the address, 172.31.16. And we can associate additional CIDR blocks if we want to with that. We've got three subnets because there are three availability zones. This is EUS 2B, this is 2A, and this should be 2C, and it is. We've got one root table. This is the master root table. We've got one internet gateway. We don't have any NAT gateways. We don't have any elastic IPs, and we do have one option set. Now, this DHCP option set we'll discuss more when we talk about Route 53, but this basically just provides the IP addressing and DNS resolution for any EC2 instances or any services you deploy into a subnet that need to have a dynamic IP and DNS name. Okay, now if we want to create a custom VPC, I just click on Create VPC, I give it a name, I give it a CIDR block. Now we'll talk a little bit about addressing. There we have it. So now I have my custom VPC. When you're creating custom VPCs, always think about what you're going to connect to. So I've used 10.1, which is a private subnet. Now, that means that if I have any other 10.1 addresses inside of my network that I'm going to connect to it, either on my data center or in other VPCs, I'm going to have a conflict. I'm going to have an issue. So when you start setting up custom VPCs, always think in the broadest terms. What are my data centers using for IP address ranges? What are my other accounts using for IP addresses? Because if they overlap, you won't be able to interconnect. OK, so we've looked at the default VPC. We've looked at setting up a custom VPC. Pretty straightforward. 